you very much, Gary. Um, thank you to everybody who's joined um, and really joins as we go along. And thank you to all those on YouTube watching this later on. Um, so uh, this is um, one of a series of, uh, of talks. Um, not, uh, there we go. It wasn't moving on. Um, so this is one of a series of, uh, of talks uh, by myself and, uh, and some of my colleagues at, uh, at Mueller Awards Products. Um, I'm Joe Zipfin, I'm the uh, Area Sales Manager for the UK, Ireland, uh, Netherlands and Germany. So I look after part of Europe along with one of my colleagues. Um, and uh, this is a series uh, about uh, making our old pipes new again. Uh, and this is the European perspective of that. Um, my colleagues have presented on this topic for, uh, with the North American perspective, and with the Southeast Asian perspective or the Asian perspective and uh, and I'll be um, looking at this from a, a European perspective. Um, so uh, firstly I just want to uh, let you know that I've barricaded the door to try and stop the kids coming in and I've shut the window so hopefully we can't hear the dog starts barking but apologies if uh, if you do hear any of that uh, but that's just the times we're living in at the moment so I'm, I'm sure you're all so, uh, and with that, I'll, uh, I'll start. Uh, so this is the obligatory image of a huge burst on a water network. Uh, we have to have these in every um, deck that we have about uh, about pipes and about leakage and bursts. Uh, but it, it's it's the law. So. Um, so here's an image that we have of a, a pipe bursting in, in North America um, and you've got this uh, cool guy walking away from an explosion here like in an action movie. Um, I'm sure he's actually on the phone to, uh, to his boss, um, to the repair crews, to customer services maybe to explain uh, that the water is going to be offline. Um, and maybe it's a UCLA campus in Los Angeles because, uh, because this burst is just flooded a newly built $2 million basketball court. So maybe he's explaining to them why that might have happened. And later on, he's gonna be having lots of meetings about how they potentially could have avoided this. And, uh, and these are potentially avoidable. Um, you know, if, if that pipe had been replaced, if they'd have known beforehand, they might have been able to do something in order to prevent this from happening. Um, some more images here. Um, th these are uh, very, um, important in terms of uh, in terms of pipe replacement because uh, because it's our it's our future. Um, these are images from NASA which show uh, from 2017 and to 2018 uh, the the difference where that they've had a, a huge where we've had a huge heat wave in Europe um, and basically there's a huge drought uh, and this is an event which is uh, is in the past been very uncommon and and as we move into the future with climate change is begun, is going to become more and more common um, for each degree of global warming there will be 10 to 15 days additional heat wave per, per year on average um, so that there's images like this for the rest of Europe and the rest of the world um, and it's a pretty scary outlook to think that there are going to be more of those kind of events which can potentially cause uh, you know, ground movement and um, and droughts and you know um, uh, as to be seriously in, in, in need of water. So um, this is the kind of situation we're living in. So and that, and that relates to to these challenges here. So that this is from the uh, European Federation of National Associations of Water Services in Europe. So uh, and it's the ten big challenges of, for the next ten years. And number one there, protecting water as a vulnerable resource. Um, that resource is going to become more and more stretched as, as time goes on um, with both climate change and with population increase um, and through and, and for other reasons, um, uh, through water sources and, and things like that. So, um, so clearly protecting the water that we have is, is extremely important and that includes the water that we have in our networks, the treated water which has been put into our networks and the water that's being returned to the network, to, to the environment. Um, so I've just outlined some of these here, which, uh, which I think are uh, related to the topic 
um, clearly protecting water, uh, giving water its value in the circular economy. Um, not just water, but also all of the resources which we use in order to make that water available to customers. Uh, so the materials that we put in the ground, the pipes, the materials that we use to, the, to clean the water, um, both as it's, as it's coming in for, for use and, and on the way back into the environment, and everything that we do in between. Um, increasing, the resor uh, increasing resource efficiency in the water sector. So it, I think efficiency is, a, is uh, something which is a, a growing topic of, and uh, a growing area of concern. And it's, and it's very important, and that's both, both efficiency in terms of the use of water and also in terms of our operations and how we act in order to be able to uh, maintain our networks and to be able to improve our networks over time and to be able to be ready for the future that's coming. Um, setting the right price water services, so uh, that's obviously in relation to cost and efficiency is highly related to cost. And, uh, and it's also related to what we're talking about today in terms of uh, pipe replacement um, and, the, and the cost of managing and, uh, and creating new networks. And managing long-term assets in a fast-changing environment. And that, that fast-changing environment is both in terms of uh, climate change, uh, in terms of population growth, in terms of technology advancement and, and everything else. So these are some of the challenges that we are facing. And here's an example here in terms of uh, policy and the way that, uh, that the industry are uh, working towards meeting those challenges. So this is uh, some graphics from Ofwat in the UK, the uh, financial regulator in the UK. Uh, on the top here you see some aspirations to transform a water company's performance and there are, there's a huge amount of goals and targets that they've set and, and requirements that they've set up on the water companies in the UK in order to, uh, to improve that performance. And there's some statistics there below, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, there's uh, the drive to, uh, for water companies to meet long-term challenges. So there's, there's, there's often uh, an impetus to look at, look at short-term uh, gain instead of the long-term, but uh, but you know the the assets that we put in the ground are going to be there for a long time. Like the assets that we have now have been there for a long time, and we need to think about the future whenever we whenever we take actions, and not only think about the next few years that uh, that we may be working in the jobs that we're working in. Um, and also for water companies to create create uh, to to provide a better public value. So um, so that's both in terms of uh, in terms of things like employment and the resources that they provide back to the environment and, and reservoirs and, and things like that. Um, and also the value which we provide in terms of value for money uh, the, the, and uh, for, the, for the, um, the water that we provide for, for customers. Um, under there, I've just added some additional graphics from other, these are taken together from various different sources uh, from, from off what. Um, so we've got some specific goals there, and there's lots of these goals which have been set. Um, but I think these, some of these are interesting in terms of uh, they've asked water companies to uh, reduce bursts by 12%, cut leakage by 16%, and this is over the next five years. This starting this year, the new amp period, amp seven, new investment period, um, and while at the same time reducing bills by 12% on average for inflation. So efficiency clearly is going to be very important to that and targeting efforts. Um, and some things on methodology at the bottom there. So, so uh, there are lots of things set out in terms of methodology, how they're going to actually achieve these aspirations and goals. Um, here's one of them. It's, the, it's improving long-term asset resilience. Um, that will help them hit targets in both the short term and in the long term, which is, which is uh, even more important to keep in mind. So there are, there are things being put in place there to, to make sure that companies are working towards long-term goals. So um, how do we meet long-term goals of asset resilience when we have uh, an aging network in the ground? Um, now age is just a number. So I, I've talked a lot on this one and on this slide more about it's more about deteriorating mains than it is about the, the age of the mains themselves. So um, you can see on the picture on the right hand side there, 
uh, from 1900 and uh, pipes being installed in Thames water. Um, and many of the pipes that these gentlemen are installing are still in the ground today. Uh, the average age of pipes in the network is um, over 50 years. And depending on the, uh, on the place in, in Europe where you, where you reside. Um, but, uh, but I think a, a common theme is in Europe and across the world is that we have um, a massive amount of aging pipes in the ground. And <clears throat> those pipes are deteriorating at varying rates. Uh, and those varying rates depend on a lot of different factors. They can depend on the quality of the materials that were installed, uh, the ground which they were installed in, uh, the, how the pipes were stored before they were installed, and the quality of the install. There's, there's so many things, that the uh, pH of the water, the aggressiveness of the soil, all very important things. Um, so it, it's very hard to, uh, to estimate how much, by how much a pipe is going to deteriorate um, just by looking at individual variables, because there are so many of those variables. Uh, that a pipe can be in different condition at one end of the street to the other end of the street. And we see that on a regular basis. And age is just one part of that equation. Clearly pipes deteriorate with age, but age is only one part of that equation. Some pipes you know, that are over 100 years old are in perfect condition, and some are not. So um, <clears throat> deteriorated pipes become more likely to fail. So as pipes become deteriorated, they are more likely to fail because the structural integrity of those pipes is reduced um, and they have reduced resilience to events. So, uh, so it's both, uh, they are both more fragile in terms of, in terms of the consistent leakage and, and burst, regular bursts. And they're also less resilient to events such as the freeze thaw that we had in the UK a couple of years ago. Um, to ground movements, climate change, and, and various other things which happen, transients on the network and things like that. So they become uh, more sensitive and uh, they are more likely to burst or leak. Now, <clears throat> one of the issues that, that we have is that uh, the pipes are mostly buried in the ground. Um, so uh, it seems like an obvious statement, but we, we can't see them and it's very difficult to determine the condition of something which is buried under the ground and we can't see it and we can't get to it most of the time. Um, we can't go digging up every pipe, otherwise the streets would look like they do in this picture, um, apart from in colour. Um, so we, we can't dig up all of the pipes to test them. Um, it's, it's too expensive and, and, and operationally not feasible, of course. So, um, But however, if we did have a way of understanding the structural integrity of the pipes in the ground, um, then it would help us to predict and avoid failures, which is, which is ultimately what we're trying to do. Um, so this graph here is just to, to illustrate uh, the fact that pipes deteriorate with different rates and that age alone is not a very good indicator of uh, a pipe's performance. There's a similar graph for, uh, for burst rates as well. You can see here pipes have been grouped by a uh, decade that they were installed and then uh, plotted against the, the leakage rates. And you can see that there's almost no correlation here. Um, that the, there's, there's, there's no correlation here between the two. Um, and that's when you just look at age alone. And in some cases, uh, th this is a particular study which came from uh, Washington Suburban, uh, WSSC. Um, it was a study which was completed over, over a period of time with a lot of different pipes. Um, and it was done with, uh, with Arcadis. Um, and, and, and we work with WSSC to, uh, to condition assess their pipes now. Um, so this is, uh, you can get different results on different networks. This is one particular network, um, but it does illustrate that, uh, that the, the point that the pipes deteriorate with age, but you cannot necessarily predict a pipe's condition based on its age. So, um, performance. Uh, we are, at, uh, this is the water loss specialist group, so uh, it would be uh, remiss of me not to bring up uh, NRW and, and real losses. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the four pillars here of, um, of NRW real losses. So, uh, and pipeline asset management is one of those four pillars, clearly very important to managing our assets and to reducing, keeping leakage down, keeping performance high. Is, is replacing the assets that are in the ground. Um, however, 
uh, a study that's referred to in UQIR's guidance on managing leakage shows, and uh, UQIR is the, the UK uh, water industry research body. Um, it shows that leakage is not always reduced by pipe replacement. Um, and in fact, if you were to try and reduce leakage uh, by replacing pipes, then you would need to replace up to 80% of the DMA before you saw significant reduction in leakage. Um, and that can vary, but uh, the reason is, is being that the, um, if you start to replace pipes in the DMA, then, uh, then the, those pipes that were previously leaking or, or had bursted will, um, will, will now be repaired and the pressure will, will, which would have been reduced will return to normal. That pressure builds up and causes a leak or burst elsewhere on the network. So basically it's like uh, the old cartoon where the character is in a boat and there's a, a leak forms and they put the finger in it and the next one pops out and they put the finger in that one and they continue to do that until the boat sinks. So, um, you know, the, the, the only way to get around that is by replacing the whole boat, right, in that case. And that, that's, uh, that's the, uh, the metaphor here. So, um, the only, the, the other way to get around that is if you knew the condition of your network uh, and of the various pipes or of all the pipes within your network, then you could take a targeted approach because you would know where those other leaks are going to form before they form. So if you took a targeted approach to replacing pipes in your network, then you could potentially avoid this effect from happening. The other thing that you'd need to do is that when you replace those pipes, you need to ensure obviously quality of worksmanship um, and uh, it's best to avoid to, to reduce pressures if pressure is an issue that's causing causing more bursts. Uh, so correctly managing uh, the pressures on that network. Um, and ensuring that any service connections which may be uh, in, poor, in poor condition are also um, treated with the same uh, with the same um, actions. So any service mains could be replaced at the same time if they are they could be uh, damaged or could burst as well. Um, so <clears throat> managing the pipe renewal dilemma. So how much pipe should we replace That's, uh, is an interesting question. Um, and uh, it, it, there's a balance, clearly a balance between renewing our assets um, and extending the life of the assets which are currently in the ground. Um, those are typically um, activities handled by separate departments, certainly in larger water companies um, across Europe. Anyway, um, the, in terms of asset management and uh, managing the current network. Um, but should we replace uh, you know, huge amounts of pipe like they do in, uh, in Germany and, and they do have very low leakage rates and, and in the Netherlands and, and other countries. Um, that, that's one way to go. And it's, a, it's an expensive way to go, a very expensive way to go. And, and in, some, uh, uh, in, in some opinions, it's you know, wasting some money and resources. Um, however, you do get a good network at that point that, that's less likely to, to leak. Um, or do you extend asset life? So how much, how much can you put a band-aid on the solution and continue to manage um, a, a failing network? Um, or how can you manage that network so that it is, uh, so that it does last for years and years in the future? And, and the question is which assets are, uh, are most, uh, are, are gonna respond best to that? So which, which pipes are gonna be um, the ones which we can pressure manage and, and extend the life for another 50 years, et cetera. So there's a, there's a balance which is required um, and we need effective solutions. So we could implement pressure management or we could implement, uh, we could put in new assets in the ground, but they also need to be effective solutions. Otherwise, they're going to be short-term solutions. What we want is long-term solutions. Otherwise, uh, the frequency of replacement is just going to increase um, and the overall cost will, could potentially be higher. Um, and the other thing we need is targeted imp implementation there. So one thing that, that um, I think is really important is uh, going forward is for these different departments to talk to each other, to share their data. Often the data and, and uh, knowledge is not shared as much as it could be. Um, so there are, there, are, uh, there are options these days in order to, 
out, out there to help share data and to better manage the data between these and, and better manage and, and balance these things. Um, and that's something that, that we're talking about a lot and, and I'll, I'll be talking about a bit more later on. Um, of course, we're limited by uh, the budget that we can spend, the, the cost to the end customer, um, by the resources which we have, and both in terms of operational and, and physical resources, and the impact we, which we can which we can put on uh, on both the customers and the environment. <clears throat> so, um, when customers do go and replace pipe, what um, we find very frequently is that customers are replacing a whole lot of good pipes. Um, and that's because a lot of uh, replacement is not well targeted. So typically when we start to do projects, we, we find that uh, pipes which are, being, which are scheduled for replacement, um, on average around 50% of those pipes are probably actually in good condition. Um, and that's a real shame to, to not, not, not necessarily taking the pipe out of the ground, it could be left in the ground as a stranded asset, but it is a real shame to just waste good materials, waste good pipe that, that wouldn't necessarily have been, uh, have been needed to be, have been replaced. It could have been good for many years to come if we'd have uh, just managed those, those networks. Um, and uh, we, we have a, a, a quote from uh, the customer who uh, provided these images actually from WSSC said that basically when we're replacing good pipes, we're, what we're doing is digging money out of the ground and basically throwing that money away in the bin. Um, that was from Fed Five, Fred Pfeiffer at uh, WSSC in, in North America, the Water Network Asset Strategy, Man Strategy Manager. Um, and that's what we're doing. We, are, we, we can't afford to replace pipes unnecessarily. It's very expensive. And also there's, uh, there's efficiency that we need in both in terms of, not just in terms of money, but also in terms of speed. At the renewal rates which we have between 1.2 and 0.4% per year being generous probably um, at this rate 83 to 250 years it will take to replace all of the assets that are in the ground just today and also at that point we'll have other assets which are getting old um, as well so clearly we need to be efficient about which pipes we are replacing if we are going to uh, get over the hump of aging pipes which are which are coming coming up to us now <clears throat> so what can we do um, if we want to target, then we need to understand the condition of our network. Um, this is the inverse pyramid model. Um, this is, uh, this is we, we talk about this a lot, and this is actually in the uh, M77 manual in North America. Uh, we don't have an equivalent, as far as I'm aware, in Europe anywhere. Um, I've put a couple of um, images of, uh, of documents on here that we do have in Europe. Uh, one is the EU reference document for good practices on leaking management doesn't talk a lot about condition assessment um, and targeted review of asset health and resilience in the water industry. It's, it's a report by Ofwat CH2M, um, but it's not guidance. It doesn't tell people what to do. It doesn't give people uh, a framework to, to work around, um, which Ofwat are trying to work on a bit of an asset uh, resilience framework at the moment, asset health framework, but it's not doesn't really tell people how to how to do it and approaches to take. Um, this is really an, an approach which people can take and, uh, and some detail about um, methodology that they can use. Um, so you can see there at the top of the pyramid, we have uh, desktop module evaluation. Um, <clears throat> the, followed then by uh, in non-intrusive NDT in inspection. So um, towards the top of the pyramid, we have solutions which are widely applicable that we, they can be applied to the, to the breadth of the, of the network um, in terms of desktop models to the whole network, we can apply that. Um, and it, it doesn't provide as much detail as material testing there at the bottom of the network, but, but, we, but we can apply it to the whole network. Um, as you come down the pyramid, uh, it's less applicable to the whole network. So we cannot material test the whole network as we've already, uh, as we've already discussed. Um, However, you do get much more detail about that small part of the network which you do dig up, that meter of the network that you look at or, um, or, or, or whatever. Um, so there's a, a balance there in terms of the approach to condition assessment. Um, it would generally start with looking at the data which you already have in a desktop model. Uh, and depending on the, uh, the risk on the pipe which you are 
uh, trying to make a decision about or the network which you're trying, trying to make a decision about, you might move further down the pyramid at uh, non-intrusive entity inspections, which is, is one of the things which we do, um, and continue to go further down it if you need to, so uh, depending on the risk on the pipe. So for a large steel trunk main, for example, um, you might want to do further testing to ensure that you were getting the right answer before you made a full decision. Um, I'm going to mainly talk about the top two here, uh, desktop model evaluations and, uh, and non-issues of NDT inspe inspections. Um, <clears throat> the benefits that all of these give you uh, are that they help you to make better decisions about replacement, um, rehabilitation and other, act on other, other actions that you can take. They also provide you knowledge um, about your network, which will always be there in the future. It's another point of reference, another data point. Um, and that will help you to predict and prepare for, for the future. So, um, okay, so Pipe Insights. Uh, we have uh, a, a new solution at Ecologics. We have, have a number of solutions which provide a leak detection and condition assessment. Um, Pipe Insights is a machine learning engine um, which can tell us the likelihood of failure for pipes in the network. Um, this is a, a, a relatively new solution using very new technology in terms of machine learning. Um, it's an up-and-coming technology and uh, it's an AI technology which, uh, which uh, is being used across many industries, um, AI is, and, uh, and in the water industry, again, we need to keep up with the times and start to use these technologies which are available. Um, so this, uh, this image here, what it shows is at, at the bottom here of this uh, of this um, of this shape, we have uh, a huge amount of data, and and, and utilities do have a, typically have a huge amount of data. Um, it, some of it is organised, and some of it isn't. Um, but we have huge amounts of data stored on systems in GIS, in um, in uh, databases, um, and we have information on paper. You know, in people's diaries and handwritten and drawings that are uh, uh, in drawers and things like that. And we have a lot of information in people's heads. Um, so when you take that data and organize it and, uh, and put it together, then what you have is then information. So uh, you, you give it some context and that provides you information which can help you to manage your network better. If you then combine those different bits of information, uh, and you uh, create new bits of data based on links between those, then what you have, what you, you come up with then is actionable data, which you can then um, take conclusions from. Um, so you can, uh, you basically get, gain insights on that information. So uh, by, by comparing those bits of information together. So Pipe Insights is a, is a machine learning based system, as I mentioned, and what it allows us to do is rank pipes in terms of uh, the likelihood of failure. Um, <clears throat> machine learning is a, is a subset of AI um, and what machine learning does is it learns a, a, a particular data set. Um, so it trains itself on a, on a data set which uh, so it takes in uh, any amount of data which you give it, any amount of relevant data. Um, it, it learns, it starts to understand that data, it creates patterns and links and then from that, it then makes predictions um, based on that. And then it tests its own predictions and it improves its accuracy over time. So there's a staged process here. Um, and as more data comes in, as you go forward into the future, it then continues to improve the accuracy of those predictions. So that is kind of machine learning in uh, part and parcel. Um, and it allows us to, uh, what it allows us to do is, uh, analyze large amounts of data, which we otherwise would have struggled to do. Um, and, it, and, it, and it does that in, uh, with very good accuracy. It doesn't generally miss bits of information as long as that information is entered into the system. Um, it's able to create patterns which, or, or see patterns which we might not have been able to see with the human eye, make links that we might not have uh, intuitively made um, ourselves. Um, and it's able to improve and, and, and track those patterns. Um, and it's also able to make uh, new variables based on those patterns. So it's, uh, you know, 
as humans, we're not able to easily trawl through millions of points of data. It's just something that, that we're not capable of doing that machine is capable of doing. So what the system does is it takes in, we take in uh, all of the utility data. Um, so that could be uh, pressure data, it could be um, condition data, it could be, uh, it could be um, location data, um, and every other bit of data that you have uh, about your network. Um, and as long as it has a variable, so a, uh, a value, uh, a time, so, uh, or a date, um, and, a, uh, and it, as long as it's located to a, to a or, or relevant to a particular pipe, um, so if you can assign it a pipe ID, um, then, we can, then we can use that in the system. So all, all sorts of kinds of data that we can bring into the system. Um, we bring in public data, so uh, geographic information, uh, seismic data, um, weather, uh, various other things that we bring into the system, public data, um, along with some proprietary data, both, uh, both that, we, uh, that we gather and, and that we uh, calculate from those other bits of data um, in order to basically make, make up, we, we end up with thousands of new variables by comparing those various pieces of data and creating a link between them. So we take these, uh, this data set, it, it gets cleaned and the system looks for patterns and relationships between those data sets and it creates new variables based on those, on those patterns. Um, <clears throat> and then from there, um, the system is able to determine a ranking of the likelihood, likelihood of failure of every segment of pipe um, in a network. And it, it ranks each pipe segment from one to X number of segments which you have in your network um, in terms of likelihood of failure. We can also apply uh, risk of failure to that as well. So that, that can, we can create that or we can bring in other risk models and, and apply that to, to this. Um, <clears throat> so what this tells you is the pipes which are most likely to fail in your network and it does so very accurately. It does so more accurately than, uh, than just by looking at age or, uh, or by looking at the historical burst rates of, uh, of pipes which, uh, which this also uses. Um, so uh, it, this machine learning based system is able to give us a lot of insight about, uh, about our network and what is going to happen. Um, on our networks. And what it outputs is uh, it gives some uh, raw data uh, around the data that's been provided. So, uh, so it takes that and organizes it and puts it in a nice presentable fashion for, for the users. Um, <clears throat> the really key bit of information there is, is, as I mentioned, that likelihood of failure. Um, so that, that, uh, that, that is something which is uh, the the, the main point of this is, is to understand which pipes are going to fail in the next year, the next five years, and the next 20 years. Um, <clears throat> so that basically we can, we can predict and we can react accordingly for that. And, uh, and that might lead to, in terms of insights, that might lead to uh, determining which pipes might need replacing. Um, or we might want to do more condition assessment on the back of the results of this. Um, or it might tell you where you need to do more monitoring so that you can be prepared to react uh, when the inevitable happens if you're not going to replace the pipes. Um, so what it's tell, telling you to do is, is, is what action to take from, the, from this information. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a couple of case studies. And unfortunately, because this is very new, um, we don't have many case studies yet which we can, where we can name utilities, unfortunately. Um, but there are some case studies which have been done since the system has been released and it's, it's been extremely successful um, in its predictions. Um, so this is one case study where a public utility in North America uh, with 260,000 segments uh, of pipe, around 5,000 uh, meters. Um, <clears throat> so pipe insights, the system was applied to this network um, for the year 2018 um, and it was able to uh, predict 50% of all system breaks um, in the top 1% of the likelihood of failure rankings. So, so likelihood of failure is, is broken down to every segment of the system, and you can look at the top 1% of those uh, pipes which are likely to fail. Um, and within that list of 1%, with 50% of, uh, of all of the system breaks here. 
um, 86% of those pipes in the top 1% that, that uh, or 86% of the pipes, sorry, that failed um, had no prior failures, which means that you couldn't have predicted it by looking at those history. So that's shown here um, in this diagram. So on the left-hand side, we have the pipe rank. Um, so one to 260,000, which is missed off the bottom of this, but uh, goes down to 227,500 here. So, so this is by rank, all of the pipes in the network, and the each individual dot is a break on the pipe on a pipe at that rank. So, um, so these are condensed. Um, so if you just look at the prior breaks, and if you try to uh, try to plot the uh, the actual breaks versus uh, pipes which were ranked by prior breakages, um, then you wouldn't have, as we mentioned before, uh, you wouldn't have got a very good prediction of what was going to happen. So if you just tried to predict which pipes were going to break based on prior breaks, then you would have had only 16% uh, of those actual breaks would have been captured in your top 5%. Um, in the middle there, if you try to predict the likelihood of failure by age, um, then you would have uh, you would have caught forty four percent of the breaks in the top five percent. Um, so there's a, a, a better connection in this network of uh, of, of aging pipes, um, but it still doesn't tell you nearly as much as what the pipe insight system tells you, which as as we mentioned, had captured the fifty percent of the breaks in the top one percent. And here shows that we've uh, captured 70% of the breaks in the top 5% of pipes, which we've um, given likelihood of failure to. So, um, so the top 5% of likelihood of failure. So it shows you there that the system is, is capable of making better predictions than these other, um, than these other factors taken alone. Um, this is another case study, a new public utility in, again in North America uh, with 7,400 miles of, of pipe. And they used, again, to rank their probability of failure in 2018. And uh, what they found was that 17 out of the 18 pipes which were ranked most likely to fail, failed in that year. Uh, and pipe number one failed two months later. Um, and the utility director there said that we're seeing a new way of doing business there. So. Um, so this system is seeing extremely good results so far, and, uh, and we'd like to uh, apply it in, in Europe now. So uh, EPULS condition assessment. So this is moving down to the next stage in the pyramid, uh, and this is our non-invasive, non-destructive condition assessment technique. Um, <clears throat> so the basis of, uh, of this technique is that uh, the pipe will only fail when the loading upon that pipe overcomes the structure and integrity of the pipe. So regardless of, of, of what else we say, those factors have to be, have to be met. So it's only when that pipe, uh, pipe's structure and integrity reduces to a point at which the loading overcomes it, or if the loading increases over and above what that structure and integrity was. Um, <clears throat> so what we're able to measure here on the left-hand side is wall thickness. Um, material strength, we take, a, uh, we take a, a particular material strength and we calibrate for that one particular material strength, um, assuming that the material is the same. Uh, and I'll go on to explain why, that's, why that works um, on one of the following slides. Um, but in order to determine structural integrity, we need the wall thickness, material strength, and the shape of the pipe, which we, which we generally know. Um, and the loading upon that pipe can be buried, the, you know, how, how the, the um, ground above it uh, what's on top of that ground above it, roads and buildings, etc. Um, we need to look at the pressure on that pipe, both average pressure and, the, and, and any transient pressure which is uh, placed upon that pipe. So that's why pipes fail. Um, <clears throat> and if you, we, we saw that graph earlier on, plotting age against leakage rates. If you then plotted uh, pipe integrity against leakage rates, you can see here that there's clearly a much better correlation. This is from the same study, the same group of data, which shows that, uh, that there's an 89% correlation there between the integrity rating. This is a scoring system of one to five, which we've applied uh, to the pipes. 
Um, and there's a far better correlation there between leakage rates and uh, those plant fertility ratings. Um, this is again a similar graph for burst rates. It looks slightly different. It's uh, it's kind of um, <clears throat> smoother along the bottom, but it and it ramps up there when you get to around three three point five um, more quickly. So uh, so pipes in uh, are okay until they get into further worse condition, but before they start to really see breakages um, uh, bursting out. So. Um, so what is it that we're actually measuring? So we are measuring uh, the, uh, the average effective wall thickness of a pipe between two points. And I'll, I'll show you how we do that between two points in a second. Um, but basically, uh, you can see there on the top right, the, uh, the pipe, we are, we are measuring uh, the, uh, the part of the pipe which supports its structural integrity. Um, so we're not measuring uh, tuberculation, we're not measuring um, cracks and things like that, that those will be excluded from our results where the crack, uh, as far as the crack comes into the pipe. Um, <clears throat> so that those will reduce the thickness of the pipe. Um, so we're only measuring the part of the pipe which provides structural integrity. Um, at the bottom right there, you can see that in some cases, uh, some graftization or lining will provide some structural integrity. Um, but as I mentioned, because we calibrate for a specific material, so if, for example, uh, if we had ductile iron, um, we would calibrate the results, the wall thickness to uh, wall th effective wall thickness of ductile iron, and any lining within that pipe would account for a smaller thickness of, of a smaller additional thickness of, of ductile iron, basically. So, um, so those thicknesses are accounted for, but they, but they account for a a lesser structural integrity, so they account for a lesser wall thickness in our results. So they are represented within the results. And as that wall thickness decreases, the, uh, the resistance to stress decreases. Um, and we're using speed of sound in order to determine this. Um, it's a scientific, scientific method. We've, we've proven it many times. We have um, a huge amount of uh, validation data, which we're happy to provide. Um, third-party validation data and studies done on the data which show that this works. Um, the way that we actually do it in the field, we, we uh, aim to be non-invasive at all times. So we try and keep the risk down in, in, taking the in collecting the data. Um, so we use uh, a, uh, an acoustic cross-correlator and we make connections at uh, valves and hydrants using magnetic sensor. Uh, where the distances are too long, you can dig down to the crown of the pipe and put the, put the sensor on the crown of the pipe as well. Um, typically more common on, on uh, trunk mains or on rural networks. Um, but in cities in particular, uh, we generally don't need to do that. Um, we can usually find uh, enough distance between um, fittings for us to be able to take our readings. Um, <clears throat> we need around between 80 and 200 meters in order to, in order to do this in terms of distance between the sensors. Um, so we place our sensors on the network and we produce a sound at a third point, which then passes between the two sensors and we take a really accurate velocity reading um, of that sound as it passes between the two sensors. And from that, uh, and from some known properties of the, of the water, so we'll test the bulk modulus of the water and the temperature, um, and given a particular material, um, material uh, strength, the Young modulus, um, we will be able to then determine the wall thickness of the pipe between the two sensors. That's an average wall thickness between those two points, um, but what it does do is it represents every bit of pipe between those two points. So a brand new pipe would have uh, a thickness of the day that it was installed, um, and any loss of thickness along that pipe would gradually then reduce the overall uh, wall thickness between those two points. That we measure. And we also, uh, because we're using cross correlators, we also do leak detection at the same time. Um, so in most projects that we do, most, most uh, significant projects that we do in terms of size, not in terms of, uh, in terms of the significance of every project is significant, of course. <laughs> um, but uh, in, in most projects that we do, we also find leaks at the same time. Um, and that provides additional value to our customers and also it gives you more information about the condition of your network. Um, so that data, uh, is uploaded to the cloud via our GIS system. So we have a live system on site where the data is uploaded to, uh, to, to the cloud, um, to our team in Canada. Um, and the team in Canada 
um, analyzes that data, they analyze that velocity information in order to, um, in order to de determine the thickness of the pipe. And what they return is, uh, is tabulated data and GIS layers of data, which will tell you the condition of each segment of pipe tested. So you can see there in the top right, uh, the red, amber, green of uh, segments of pipe which have been tested there. Um, <clears throat> and this is information which water companies can, can make decisions upon and act upon. Um, we can also provide remaining service life in addition to this. Um, so we have models which we have, uh, which we have, um, which we have built up over time and that we've, uh, that we've done studies on um, in order to be able to determine uh, that the, the remaining service life of a pipe based on the loss of thickness over time. So, you know, the original thickness of a pipe and, you know, the thickness of the pipe now, then using uh, models to predict how the pipe is deteriorating and how it will continue to deteriorate, you can then determine the, how long that pipe uh, has remaining in service until it gets to a point at which it is uh, no longer acceptable um, in terms of the levels of failure. So, um, I'm going to talk about some case studies now. Um, so, uh, the first case study here is uh, is the largest project that we have um, worldwide now in here in the UK. Um, and it's with uh, SES Water. Um, it started last year, and uh, and initially we did some uh, we did some testing in order to uh, ensure that they were happy with the uh, with the validity of the data. So they went out and tested some sites, and we did some digging and tested pipe, and uh, and they were happy with the uh, with the accuracy of the results. They were very happy with that one, and, and when we also put it together with with the rest of the validation results, they were they were extremely comfortable with, with the data that we were providing. Um, so then we set out to do a 30 DMA trial uh, over the course of a year, around 250 kilometers to be condition assessed. Uh, and that is still ongoing at the moment. It's been slightly extended because of the COVID-19 situation, unfortunately, but, uh, but it is ongoing and we do have results from that at the moment. Um, the scope included metallic pipes um, over 30 years old and under 200 millimeters in diameter. Um, and the idea of this project is that it is a, it's a holistic, project. Um, I mentioned earlier on about different departments not talking to each other and needing to share data more. This is what's happening here. They, they, are, uh, they are combining huge amounts of information um, and using that to make better decisions. Um, so we're working with Atkins, uh, part of the SN, SNC Laven Group, um, on this project. Uh, we are providing condition data and Atkins are reviewing that data along with other bits of data um, in order to give uh, SES water um, uh, in, in order to give them information and recommendations on actions to take and uh, and SES water will take that forward and, and it will allow them to make better investment decisions and hopefully uh, improve their efficiency and their return on investments in the future. Um, it will, they're also going to be using that information to manage their networks better. Um, uh, Jeremy Heath there at SES will talk to you passionately about how he would like to be able to use condition data to determine what actions can be need to be taken on a, on a water network and what actions can comfortably be taken. Um, can you turn off a main? Can you do various other sort of things um, safely? And they, at the end of the day, what they're trying to do is improve the customer service. Um, so, uh, so this is how it looks. Uh, we do condition assessments. We provide condition assessment data on their network on on large. Uh, a, large, a large amount of the network um, and Atkins then look at that data alongside other uh, sources of data and then they make decisions about what actions to be taken um, and those decisions I'm just going to skip forward on this. Um, those the decisions about what actions they're going to take is is open so there, there's not a preset judgment about what actions they are going to take they are, they are open to uh, to installing the PRVs, to replacing whole networks, to not replacing any amount of the network, et cetera. So, um, so it's a very, they're taking a very open view as to what that decision uh, will be at the end of the day. Um, this, is the, uh, this is the team here. Uh, it looks like they're social distancing there already, but the picture was actually taken last year. Um, maybe they just don't like each other, but <laughs> no, they do really. Um, so uh, 
And this is an, an example of uh, a map of some of the data which we've returned, the GIS data which, which we've returned, showing some pipes in moderate condition and in good condition. Um, and Atkins produced these uh, wheels of opportunity for SES water. So um, they use the uh, condition, they're looking at uh, pressures on the network, water quality and various other things in order to look at where there are opportunities to improve those networks um, or, or all those networks in, in brilliant condition already. Um, and here are some of the results. Um, so they provided me uh, with four DMAs to talk about here, some, some of the headline results here. Um, and as you can see, uh, there is uh, the, the forecast lengths and costs of those which were forecasted to be replaced, pipes which were forecasted to be replaced. And then on the right hand side, you have the, the now final actual proposed lengths to replace and proposed costs. Uh, this is based on, uh, on condition data alone. Um, there will be some other decision making processes going on in terms of uh, looking at head loss and water quality and things like that too. But if you were to base this just on whether a pipe is likely to fail or not, uh, then, then they can make decisions here to save a huge amount of money. And, and in a lot of these cases, they are going to defer these replacements um, and they are then able to spend that money elsewhere on, uh, on other interventions in order to improve those networks and to reply to, to replace pipes in other areas which need it more. Um, so again, it's that efficiency there. Um, and the kind of headline figure there is a potential 2.1 million um, or potential 1.9 million pound saving based on those four DMAs alone. Um, and we are continuing to assess more and more DMAs as time goes on. We also have identified and, and, and uh, raised five leaks. Um, so SES Water have decided to uh, continue this and extend this project into the future. Um, and they're hoping to condition assess the rest of their network um, and to continue this and, and, and bring this into a business as usual process um, and all decision making will go through this project. So it's been extremely successful and we hope to, for it to continue to be. Um, last case study here, this is uh, uh, Dusseldorf. Um, in Germany. Um, so uh, Dusseldorf has, uh, Stadtford Dusseldorf have uh, 1,700 kilometers of pipe um, and a couple of years ago they identified that they have um, some cast iron and, and steel mains uh, which were installed between 1950 and 1965 which were which they uh, had um, with, they, they said were strongly prone to corrosion. They uh, they suspected that they were that they may be in poor condition and that, and they wanted to do something about it. They were wondering whether to replace those pipes or not. They're large mains. They couldn't get to them physically in, in the ground, and they didn't have a whole lot of historical data. So they decided to bring us in, and we looked at 35 kilometers of those pipes in order to determine what actions they should take. Um, this is some of the results in a graph format here. Um, and at the end of the day, what they decided was that 92% of the assessed mains could be deferred for at least five years and 46% of the pipes could be deferred for 10 plus years. Um, so they were extremely happy with these results. Um, if they'd have replaced all of that pipe, then they would have wasted a lot of money. They, they wouldn't have known where to go and they wouldn't have necessarily replaced the right pipes, the right parts of those network. Um, so they've managed to save a lot of money and, and just sort of now work with us every year. Um, I should also mention we work with Sangaban in Europe and uh, they're a representative in Europe for us. And, uh, and they are also now able to do field work for us in Europe as well. So, um, so we're looking forward to doing more and more work in Europe. We work with many utilities in Germany and France and, uh, and the Netherlands and we look forward to continue to do more. Thank you very much. Um, sorry that I'm slightly long there. I don't think I went over an hour, but, uh, but uh, please uh, ask any questions that you'd like to ask now. Um, Gary? Yeah, thank you very much, Joe. That was a very good um, presentation, a lot of information there. So let's give um, people a little while to type their questions in. It, it does, from past experience, it does take um, a while for the questions to come in. Okay. I noticed on your last um, case study that you had the pipe diameters were quite large. 
Uh, no way. Now, now that, that's normally quite large for ePulse, isn't it? But you managed to get it to work? And so, yeah, I, I've, uh, I've skipped by this a little bit quickly just because I was trying to get to the, the question time here. So, um, but uh, yes, we did also introduce some broadband electromagnetic testing on the large steel mains. Um, so large mains we're completely fine with. Um, steel mains become a little bit more difficult just because of the thickness to diameter ratio of the pipe. Um, however, we can we can work with steel pipes up until uh, kind of 12 inch with no problem. Um, larger than that, then we would like to bring in uh, other techniques in order to be able to calibrate our information off. Um, so what we're looking for is uh, the formation of pitting on those pipes and, and what that might look like so that we can make more predictions. Um, and, and better our models on for those particular pipes um, and to calibrate the data from. So, uh, so we'd normally do, so we, in this case we did, uh, we EPOS tested all of the pipes and we did a, a certain level of broadband electromagnetic testing as well. Uh, and the results lined up very well together, uh, as you can see on this last one here. Um, yeah, yeah. And I entered it there, but uh, th th there was a, they made a statement as well to say that the, uh, that the results were very close to each other in terms of the broadband electromagnetic testing versus the uh, the equals testing results. Um, so they were happy to to trust the rest of the results there too. Okay. We don't seem to have any questions that have come that have come through yet. But uh, I'm guessing if you go to your last page, it's got your email address, has it? Yep. Yep. Uh, email address there. Jay. I'm guessing if anybody has any questions after the case, then um, then they can contact you on on that email address. Yes, of course. Yeah, um, uh, contact me by email or, or or give me a phone call. Uh, I should have put plus four four on there for the UK. Uh, yeah. feel free to to um, link with me on LinkedIn, um, and uh, and yes, happy to share any information, talk more about these case studies or uh, or the work that we're doing, uh, the rest of the work that we're doing in Europe and, uh, and in other places in the world. Um, it's, it's growing and growing. And, uh, and I think that's, uh, you know, that this, this area of asset health assessment and uh, condition assessment is something which is becoming more and more hot topic uh, as we need to replace more of those aging pipes. And uh, as the time uh, to do it decreases. Um, and, and as, uh, as we want to get better performance out of our networks. Yep, I totally agree with that. And so we haven't had any questions. So just like to say thank you very much, Joe, and uh, we'll, we'll end now. Okay. Thank you very much for everybody for joining. Thank you, Gary.